capitalist demands satisfaction. Honor for him is an appetite, an obsession to kill. No apology is accepted, no quarter given. Only death will satisfy honor. Hello everybody and welcome back to another spoiler review with me, a Border Prince. Today, finally, we are talking about the Palatine Phoenix, which is the Fulgrim novel, which is part of the Primark series. And it's book six, I believe. And it's by the mighty Josh Reynolds. So, where to begin? Um, I think I'll just explain the story roughly and then we'll, we'll go on to some of the things I really liked in this. And first off, I think this is probably... This and Perturabo, for me, are the best of this series so far. The Korax one has just come out, so I'm going to get that soon. And that's by Guy Haley as well, so that should be, should be a cracker. It should be a cracker. But this one was incredible. Um, I really feel like... Uh, I know sort of the, the first book that we got a real taste of the Emperor's Children and Fulgrim, really, was the, um, the, the Fulgrim novel in the Horus Heresy. And that was by Graham McNeil, I believe, if my memory serves. Um... But I feel with the work he's done with um, Fabius Boyle and there's the other Reynolds. I'm not too sure if they're related, I don't know. But who does Lucius? But um, yeah, what Josh Reynolds has achieved with the Emperor's Children, he, he is kind of Mr. Emperor's Children now. That's his baby. Um, they're stunning. And the work he's done here really sort of adds to that and sets the, sets the scene. And you see the seeds of their corruption of their pride, of their arrogance, of their of their perf- their quest for perfection. Um, and it's really great. And the thing with Josh Reynolds I really like is I, I always get like flavours of things that I've read. Uh, sort of. So I think he's a very learned man, you know, history and philosophy and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know whether I'm just reading too much into it, um, but I feel like there's a lot of shit in there that it's all mingled together perfectly and just he really achieves something really great. And again... Just like his work with um, Luke, Lucas the Trickster and the other novels he's done, um, there's a sense of comedy there. You know, there's a sense of humour there. There's jokes, you know, there's things that not just you go in, oh, that's awesome. You're like, that's awesomely funny. It's brilliant. It's truly great. It's truly great. Um, before we go on, I'm keeping my coat on because it's a bit fucking chilly. Anyway, what happens? So, they go to a planet... What's it called? Bar- <laughs> Barbados? I forgot what the fucking planet's called. This is a great review. Um, yeah, and again, just to explain, for those of you who have been waiting for this for a while, uh, I'm, I misplaced the book uh, somewhere, and I had to get it back. And uh, yeah, I uh, managed to read it, uh, but it took a while. And yeah, the last couple of weeks I've just been out of action and just haven't had time to sit down, think about what I want to say, and do this. So that's where we are. Okay, so... Um, oh, fucking hell, what's the planet called? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear god oh god <laughs> immediately immediately this is bad this is so bad oh god <laughs> it's called ba- what's it called boys ass boys ass okay so i'll go over the basics to foot and then we'll go over the awesome bits at the end so the basic story is um, this is the Emperor's Children's, with Fulgrim at the head, their first move as a sort of legion strength, or close to legion strength, after they've rebuilt their numbers, because the Emperor's Children, of course, went through a, a catastrophic incident and reduced their numbers down to 200 uh, Emperor's Children before Fulgrim was rediscovered on Chemos. And that's what we get into here. We get some nice bits about Chemos and uh, Fulgrim's backstory, which, again, it's it's not as... In depth as the Perturabo book, where we actually have him there in the moment, he's sort of reminiscing on things. But it's nice how it's all tied together. It's a good, it's good stuff. It's good stuff, and it has something that I think lack was lacking from the Ferris Manus one, um, where we get that sense of who they are and their struggles they've been through. And I think they really missed a beat with Ferris Manus, as I think a lot of people are aware. You know, um, killing him so early. He's got all these mysteries around him. I mean, what the fuck's going on with his living metal? Come on, can we not just have this? This tale told to us. Anyway, um, they go to Boisas. Now, Boisas is a planet which has survived old night uh, at a sort of moderately high level of technology um, comparatively to other things. It's not a hive city. They're just sort of a, a civilization. I'd say comparable to to us, to Earth in the current day. Um, 
they have two ships. They have like uh, maybe two or three, I forget, uh, sort of rackety old piece of shit battle cruisers, uh, transport ships in space, you know, that have been left over from when they were at their height. Uh, and they use these ships to take prisoners and slaves and convicts to their moons to mine for minerals and stuff like that, uh, which act as penal colonies. On the planet itself, and uh, this is what I like, he's really captured. Uh, He's got a pretty good grasp of politics, and there's things in this that you get on that. Um, and he tells, it's it's brilliant how he's managed to tell this story of this society which is crumbling, and it's very reminiscent of life today. Um, there's a few quotes that I want to pull out. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, fantastic planning by me. But if I don't do this, I'll never do it. And I've got to just, I've got to do it. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it reminded me very much of sort of some of the political events that have occurred in our world at the moment. Um, it's very reminiscent to that. And I think it's, again, I cannot recommend this enough. This is, if you like Perturabo, you'll love this. And if you like uh, full, the, the Fabius Boyle novels, you'll fucking love this. It is quality. So, what happens is uh, Fulgrim decides to take uh, just a handful of marines to the planet's surface. And we get a bunch of stuff about like the individual marines there, some backstory from them, notable characters or would become notable characters uh, in the Horus Heresy going forward and their sort of backstory. And the sort of, the tale of how it's, it's, it's a cutting wound within the Legion as it is at the moment for the original uh, 200, um, the original survivors of the Cataclysm the only Emperor's children, because they weren't strong enough to be a legion like everybody else. They ended up getting attached to the Imperial Army to act as champions, which I think is a nice... You can see how that psychologically would affect them, because then the ones who come up afterwards see these guys who are used to being the ultimate soldier in an engagement. You know, they've got that flair for leadership that has come from being, you know, a demigod leading a thousand men, humans with las rifles. They've they've got that. I can see how that would affect you and it would affect the foundation of your legion. Um, obviously, Fulgrim, he's very much into perfection. He's very much from the start, you know. Um, and we get here how they adopt that as a sort of mantra, as a, philosophy, a guiding philosophy of their legion. And now this is their first engagement. So they land on the planet with a handful of guys and Fulgrim's kind of, he's trying to do it peacefully. That's his whole idea. He wants to... He can't make up for the, the vast numbers of his brothers, but he can do it with flair and perfection. Uh, he can he can achieve a perfect compliance. So little cost in men, um, quickly, but with words or just with his own sort of political machinations, which he has some skill at, as we'll see, as you see in the novel. And um, basically, he they land on this planet. Now, the planet itself is a society, like I said, that's survived. They've sort of got a reasonable level of technology, but um, it's degrading. They're not building anything new. It's just sort of slowly crumbling away. They're maintaining what they've got. They have these flying Zephyr things, which are like, not grab vehicles, but they're sort of floating. So it's, a, it's best to imagine them like um, fast moving air blimps, airships and stuff like that, uh, which I think is a nice, it's a nice imagery. Um, so they land on the planet and what's become of the planet is, as uh, as as <laughs> as the spider, as the spider uh, mentions, it's it's fallen to cultural ennui, and they've become a society which is rampant with assassination attempts, rampant with uh, factionalism. Uh, you know, if you want to get all you know political, um, the state, the leadership of the state, <clears throat> has not got the uh, the grip on violence that it should have. For any state to function. Um, so you get all these different spheres of influence and power. And they're all competing against each other. And the planetary governor has just about held on to power. But that's only because he's seen as a figurehead. And uh, no one else wants to take him out. Because they'll be the they'll be the person who, <laughs> who is the head of the pyramid. And they'll be the next for the chopping block. So it's like a unsteady... A massive amount of violence is going on, a massive amount of assassinations, but there's a relative stability because no one wants to make that move because they know they're not strong enough to compete against the other areas of power, the other members of the nobility and the aristocracy. Um, he says it perfectly. 
Fabius says it perfectly. Here we go. Oh, no. There we go. It's actually Fulgrim. He says, uh, cultural ennui. Uh, they have become locked into a, malfun a malfunctioning system, unable to escape its pull. We shall correct the system and simplify it in, pro in the process. And, you know, this is... That's... That's fucking excellent. If you ever read, if you keep up with politics and stuff like this, and you sort of have a a view of the world, um, you keep up to date with things. You, I can see this sort of mirrored in the real world. I guess without getting too deep into it, it's it's beautiful. It's truly beautiful. Um, the history of this planet is there was once a, a global government of the several of free nations, and um, what happened was uh, there was a global war. Uh, eventually this global government uh, broke down and um, the one Boisas, is it Boisas themselves? I forget. <laughs> it's been three weeks since I finished reading this, lads. I apologise. The one nation was glassed uh, by the by both of the other two and then eventually the, the main nation that's left now um, uh, conquered and, oh no, no, no. They, yeah, by doing that, they forced the other ones to surrender or suffer the same fate and turn them into a slave or hel helot nation uh, and basically turned their entire nation into farmland um, agriculture and in this glassed area which is a nice little touch what we'll get to in a bit there's the only people there are uh, some mutant people who well I'll tell you about it now I immediately thought okay well so they go to the planet and one of the things <laughs> oh god I've got to get this balanced in my mind okay so that's the situation on the planet right that's the situation on the planet now, Fulgrim wants to get the planet into compliance. So he tells them all kinds of bullshit about, um, you know, fairness and equality. We're going to bring the Imperium here. Your lives are going to improve. It's going to be fantastic. I like equality too. I mean, I'm not actually saying you're going to get that, but I like the idea of that. We have noble aspirations for the species. And I've also got a battle cruiser in orbit, and I could kill you all very, very quickly. And it uh, and it basically progresses like that. There's a lot of sort of internal politicking. Um, we have an amazing character, a Remembrancer. Is it Remembrancer? No, she uh, a woman called Pike, who is a representative. She's old European aristocracy, and she's a fucking bitch. And it's great. It's perfect. She sounds like an amazing woman, and exactly the kind of woman you would need in that situation. Um, she's got a little band of assassins. It's fucking great. It's really quality. Um, so they end up in this... The, part of the culture of Boisas is the duel. And this comes into the story later on because there was a... Um, what you, I suppose what you would call like a, a, an order of... Not necessarily knights, but duelists who were sort of Robin Hood figures on the planet. And at one time, they were a real threat... They grew to such a threat. Um, they wanted to topple the existing order of the aristocracy and replace it with, um, you know, democracy, uh, freedom for all, equality, uh, redistribution of wealth, you know, a perfect world. They wanted to build a utopia. Unfortunately, the elites didn't like this and took them out. Um, but it spread quite rapidly throughout the population. But after they were wiped out, um, they sort of survived, but in a very small amount, uh, very small numbers and sort of retreated to the peripheries and belief in their ideals became a sort of tokenistic sort of superstitious faith um, of a fist, uh, a black hand, if you will. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's that's something that's going on in the background. But dueling <clears throat> has continued to be part of their culture, which is pretty common amongst a lot of cultures, uh, at least, you know, up until the last like 100 years. Uh, so Obviously, the Emperor's children are dead into dueling and stuff. <laughs> so they have a sort of something in common immediately. And we get some nice scenes where, um, is it Cyrus? Cyrus is fighting it out with like a pack of these, these boys ass uh, noblemen, you know, and like taking them all out and stuff. But they're watching him, you know, it's it's beautiful. Um, Fulgrim makes a nice relationship with the sort of Chancellor, the second in command, who turns out to be a member of this now very, very secret order of uh, of idealists, you know, and Fulgrim gets this from him. He offers him the throne and he turns it down. So he ends up going with the existing governor, who's a bit of a dickhead, but, you know, he's smart enough to see a, a good thing when he comes along and he goes along with this. Um, <clears throat> and what happens is basically, 
And again, very much, if you've been paying attention to like current events in the Middle East and previously in that area as well, specifically, uh, and you know, in the Balkans and stuff like this, um, there's a lot of sort of, I wouldn't say accurate history or anything, no, it's not, but I can see where Josh Reynolds has taken stuff like away from, uh, from the current world and brought it into this book. And it's, it's quality, you know, people are acting like people would in this situation. I think that's what, that's what, I suppose that's what um, distinguishes him from other novelists they have. Sometimes, in, well, a lot of the time, some of their novelists do things, they have the characters doing things that people wouldn't do, you know, like they wouldn't do. <laughs> it's like ridiculous, you know. Um, here, he has people, you can understand the rationale of why they're doing them. And that's what I think distinguishes Josh Reynolds from a lot of the authors. He's got a, a real grasp on human nature and psychology and stuff. Really, he has, genuinely. Um, everything makes sense from the point of view of the person. They're not doing something out of the ordinary. You know, like, it, it doesn't make sense to their character and their rationale. And I love that. It's brilliant. So, they progress in this way. Um, one of the things that, um, obviously, Fall Green wants is a recruitment world. So, he sets Fabius Boyle. And we get a lot of stuff about the, the disgust, the antipathy that the other Emperor's children have for Fabius. They call him the spider and so on. Um, and Fabius knows this and he don't give a shit. And he's like, well, I did what I needed to do. And of course, later on, we see, it's nice to see that, obviously, sorry, I'm just burping. I only just got back in, I had dinner out. Anyway, Fabius, having written the Fabius Bar books, I can see that he's really sort of, he's, he's, he's building that, that link to current day Fabius, if you will, and this Fabius before everything happens. And he's the same man, you know? He's the last sane man in the universe still. <laughs> well, <laughs> even then. Um, so, yeah, they go on about it. There's a lot of stuff about it. Like, they, they keep trying to get poisoned every time they go to a public event. They put Their wine's poisoned like 10 times. Like, there's more poison in it than wine at this point, you know? It's brilliant. Um, where's that gone? There was a lovely little moment that I want to just go over. Um, there we go. Oh, there's some beautiful moments. Um, they make the joke about uh, the peasants are revolting, of course, which is, they say here, an old joke, <laughs> which says to me that, you know, he's got a pretty good grasp on sort of... Um, that says a lot without with saying very little. The fact that he's even slipped that joke in there. Uh, yeah, it says a lot. I like it. Right, so with um, Fabius going around testing this population for, uh, uh, you know, whether they can, and taking their DNA samples uh, to see whether they be good recruits, good source of aspirants for the Legion as he uh, foregrim attempts to build it stronger. Um, he comes across these rad people in the deserts who are... The one Empress Children guy, I forget who what his name was. Was it Kasparos? It might have been Kasparos. But he's disgusted by these people, these rats, these these mutants. Um, but Fabius is like, no, 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 no. Look at it in the wrong way. They have survived something they should not have survived. And they've prospered to a degree. And he said, I think he says something like, I mean, they're going to go sterile and die out within a couple of generations by the looks of it. But they have survived something. They have managed to survive and the strength there so we take samples from them now of course these guys the way they're described the way josh reynolds describes them um reminds me of the sort of the, the rat surf cast of mutants that he has on his own ship as his servants as his laboratory technicians who worship him as a uh, pater familius uh a, a pater mutant 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 mutantages i can't remember they call him uh, father mutants that's what they call him um <laughs> they remind me of them and I think this is just John Josh Reynolds going this is where he got the genes for these people and then he's manipulated them and turned and cloned them and everything and turned them into these things uh, <laughs> it's a nice touch it's a little it's a little snippet so that's where Fabius's clones come from and by extension the uh, probably a little bit of the uh, new men that he's been building uh, probably a little bit of them comes from this which I think is nice. You know, it's like poetry. It rhymes. <laughs> um, they have 
a lot of political 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 stuff going on. Uh, you know, uh, the goes and meets a sort of local power broker, local sort of chieftain, I guess you'd say, an aristocrat, whatever you want to, however you want to describe it. Um, and he figures out the different power situations, and basically, uh, he manages to encourage the local army to. He orders the local army to withdraw from these regions where they're sort of. Def- they're keeping the local population hammered down, the peasants hammered down, on behalf of the nobles. Um, he pulls the army back out of there and it causes revolts. Revolts were happening anyway because the peasants are losing patience with the local authorities because they're starving and they're not prosperous. The planet's as well suffering like. Um, it's on the verge of sort of like ecological collapse. And also the radiation from the fact that half the planet's been glassed. And, uh, you know, their technology level is falling and everything. So it's all like the planet itself is on the verge of destruction. And now you've got half the continent going into revolt because the the planetary army has been withdrawn back to the capital, back to the capital city. These nobles decide enough's enough. um, And some elements of the army who are loyal to them because they've obviously a lot of their sons joined the army and stuff. So, you know, so they've got influence within its ranks. Um, So we... For Fulgrim, it weeds out the disloyal elements. Um, some of the army units, again, it's nice. It shows he knows what's going on in the world. You know, local army unit will take control of a certain area, you know, for themselves uh, and stuff like that and hold up and see what happens. Uh, I'm not saying anything, but, you know, in certain nations, this does happen. Uh, <laughs> you, and they all pull back. So then it forces the nobles to rebel. Um, thinking that, you know, Fulgrim's there, they don't believe him, that he's got this battle cruiser and this vast army. He's landed there with, like, you know, a handful of guys. Um, you know, and they want to take it, and they don't have any respect for the planetary governor anyway. So they're just banding together to take these invaders out and set themselves free from this future tyranny that they're being signed up for with joining the Imperium, which they see as... And Fulgrim says, you know... Um, he kind of says it as if it's going to be great. He says, we're going to get rid of this. We're going to change this system. This can't work. This is not going to work any longer. We've got to improve things for everybody. This planet's going to be a prosperous member of the Imperium of Man. But, but, um, what he later comes to say is, uh, well, you're just going to be compliant and you're going to serve and that's it. <laughs> you know, compliance is what compliance is. And it's, it's beautiful, and it's nice how he plays people. It's nice how he uses, he plays people's emotions. Um, we get moments where the spectacle of him as this god, and he knows this, he, he uses it to his advantage. Uh, this, this image of human perfection, he cows them. And he also kills a bunch of people, because he has to go in with his boys, and, uh, well, the four guys purge the local garrison of uh, disloyal elements as the rest of the armies are coming back to them. Um, it ends in a big uh, scrap, basically, uh, where the all the <clears throat> he wants to bring all of the disloyal elements into one place because they're all spread out at the moment. It'd be impossible to hunt them down. It would cause more damage than anything. But by bringing them all in, giving them the ambulance, uh, bringing them all back to the center allows him to kill them all in one go. And that's what he does. Um, he takes their children, and they're going to now become uh, Astartes. And, uh, yeah, he does, he does all this with relatively, well, for the Imperium anyway. No loss of resources other than a few clips and uh, some Thunderhull gunship fuel. Ah, <clears throat> right. So, as he does this, uh, their remnants are retreating. Um, this secret band of duelists, before they sort of realise what he's actually there to do, uh, they invite him to come along because they believe the bullshit because they want to believe it. And um, before then, he reads a lot of the sort of history of the planet and discovers about this secret order and so on and learns about their, their quest for perfection, for the perfect blow, which obviously speaks to uh, Fulgrim in a massive way. But later on, you get the... Well, let's go on with this. <clears throat> he attacks the last sort of stronghold, which is this ancient temple that was there from the founding, which was apparently the first place where the colonists of Boisas landed, having been led there by their uh, saviour, who um, was a, a man on terror, who led his people from terror, led them to Boisas, after killing a tyrant and destroying a dragon. I believe that's how it's put. So it's obviously some kind of emperor myth 
which is brilliant. I love it. Um, below this temple, they they're willing to sacrifice themselves, and they have a nuclear, they have a thermonuclear device, which they're going to use to blow up and kill Thorgrim. Thorgrim uh, realizes he's been trapped. He's been tricked. He was a little bit too arrogant, a little bit too brash in this situation. He didn't think they'd do this, uh, so he fights his way through to these guys. Anyway, this 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 old nuke is ticking down, and he ends it by. He's like, oh, if Ferris was here, he'd be able to sort this. Oh, Jesus, what am I doing? Um, he just stabs it and <laughs> manages to stop it somehow. <laughs> I don't know. But it's nice how he puts it. Um, so he goes back. He has a final confrontation with this Chancellor bloke who's the sort of leader of the this duelist organisation, this secret society that wants to reshape the world. And um, <clears throat> in their image. And uh, <laughs> he has a scrap of him. Um, the thing is, he's pissed off and furious. He's furious because the guy decides to let him kill him. He doesn't fight it. Um, and he has to kill him. But Fulgrim knows that by doing this, he's made this guy a martyr. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted him to have a final showdown with the leader of the enemy and be a big triumphant thing. But this guy gets to his knees and bows his head. And it spoils the, the victory for Fulgrim. It spoils the the ideal of victory, the perfect victory that he wanted, because it's made it... He's killed a, an idealist here. Um, you know, this man wasn't fighting for personal power. He wasn't a member of the aristocracy. He's a noble man who wanted to change the world for the better of his people. But then Fulgrim's just going to have to execute him, which... It, he doesn't like, you know, it's like he's, he's he's embraced the imperial truth, the plan of the emperor. Um, you know, he, it is the only way. It is the only way. But it leaves a bad taste in the mouth. And, you know, for someone like Fulgrim, so needful to prove himself, to show his perfection, um, this sours it for him. Even though no one else is probably going to know about it, he knows that... He's done something fucked up here. Uh, you know, his moral compass... He's allowed his moral compass to become completely knocked out of sync. And uh, and he's going to be celebrated for this. So I like it. It's it's deep. It's interesting. It's fun. Now, some of the amazing things. Um, <laughs> there's jokes in this. All right, so... But, so, yeah, the, the planet becomes compliant and blah, blah, blah. And a lot of the guys from there uh, become Empress children going forward. Right, so we get a lot about uh, Fulgrim's time on Chemos. Fulgrim was married, right? That's the big thing. So Fulgrim was fucking, uh, by implication. Um, we get the sort of sort of roughly backstory of how he rose to power. Uh, he was taken in by a sort of peasant uh, worker. It, Chemos was a factory world. It was run by um, the executive clans, which I think is beautiful. It's beautiful again what Ful uh, Josh Reynolds has done here. He's created this world which is clearly some kind of corporate colony that was cut off during the Dark Age and adapted to the situation. And by the time Fulgrim's born, it's falling apart, the machines are breaking down and so on. But still, it's, it's got that remnant of its initial founding. The rulers are the executives in the executive clans ruling over the people and they have their enforcers. There's police with tear gas and stuff like that. It's... It's beautiful what he's done. And I would love to see a more in-depth story of Fulgrim. And I don't understand why they haven't done this. I don't understand. I mean, I know there's like leaving the mystery there. And maybe they will once the Horus Heresy is out the way. It's a sort of... I suppose that's a quick fix on books you can do. Um, you know, uh, just do an in-depth Horus Her In-depth Primark books. Maybe one or two on them in particular. You know, them prior to um, the Heresy and stuff. So I can see why they might be holding back on that and just giving you this snippet now because it's all about the Wanga. Um, and speaking of that, <laughs> if you want to pick up this book, use the links below. Um, it's not on Audible though for some reason, but there's still loads of great books on Audible, so use the link below and get a free subscription. But uh, <laughs> you can get it from the Black Library website, the actual audio. Um, but for some reason it's not on Audible. It's really fucking annoying because I had to read this and normally something like this um, I'd listen to it because I know it'd be really good quality audio, uh, but the, the isn't on there. It's the only one that isn't on there. I don't understand what the fuck. Why? Why? Why have you made my life more difficult? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, what was I saying? Yeah, so Chemos is this... It's a brilliant tale that hasn't been told yet. And we've just got these snippets. Uh, we hear about his parents. Um, again, just sort of low-down people. Um, yeah, it's, it's glorious. It's glorious. The stuff about them before he came. Now, there's some more stuff about the assassination attempt on the Emperor when someone tried to use a nuclear bomb to kill the Emperor. Now, we've heard this in a few Horace Heresy books from way back. You know, like the Dark Angels one, it had, a, it had a recounting of that. It's been in something else as well, but the Emperor's children played an instrumental part in saving the Emperor's life in this. Um, and it was before Fulgrim was there. Uh, th there's all sorts of stuff. There's his regret about not being with his sons when they needed him most. There's a bunch of stuff about Fabius Boyle and him talking um, about, like, you know, the, the problem with the gene seed and so on and uh, the corruption that they have. And he only managed to just about stave it off. And that's why Fulgrim gives him... He lets Fabius off a lot that he wouldn't let anyone else off. And, you know... That, I mean, Fabius's corruption, not necessarily corruption, but his unique attitude for an Astartes is one of the things that drives their legion down a certain path um, because they have someone there who can instigate their worst impulses and drives. And that's what, that's what Fabius does for them. He doesn't himself. He follows orders and just does this. Um, it's interesting to me. Very interesting. And Fabius, of course, is allowed to go on his own way with his own drives, but they're they're uh, <laughs> they're less sexual <laughs> than the other guys. You know, less hedonistic than the other lot. Um, but that's a whole other story, and Fabius Ball is a fantastic character. Uh, what else is there? There's a bunch of other shit. I just can't remember at the second. Um, <laughs> there's a bunch of other shit. Oh, God. Oh, God. My mind's gone blank. Let's have a look. There's some choice quotes, though, I've got. That I just want to read out to you. Some of the funniest bits. Um, why did I... Okay, why did I note that one down? Uh, oh, here we go, here we go. So, this is the story of their, their foundation myth. Um, Sabasius was a man. He led our ancestors here, or so the stories claim. He broke their shackles and freed them from a great tyrant who claimed to be the master of all mankind. He slew a great serpent and fashioned ships from its scales so that they might escape. From out of the darkness, through the forest of stars, he brought them to Byzas, he sighed. Or so the story says, myths and half-truths. Which, there's a lot in that. There's a lot in that paragraph. Um, <laughs> as the presentation of a myth, it's brilliant. Knowing what we know about other stuff with the Void Dragon and the Emperor's Ascension and the time when there were great tyrants, psyker, super powerful psychers who ruled over humanity, you know, and the story of the Sigilites and stuff. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, here we go. Yeah, so <clears throat> there's a bunch of stuff about perfection uh, and this, this order of duelists, Fulgrim takes that ideology, that philosophy, that martial philosophy, and uses it as a foundation to the forming of the new legion as it builds up. And this is the thing as well, they've got a bit of a chip on their shoulder because um, this is the first time they've gone out. Before then they were attached to Horus. Uh, they supported Horus uh, and, the, and Horus and the Lunar Wolves in their campaigns um, because they weren't strong enough to be a fully fledged force. And again, the original 200 have grown used to being on their own. They've got their own flair. Uh, they've got their own attitude to things. They've had their own experiences because they've been fighting and leading in their own right for centuries and some, well, dozens of years, decades, maybe even hundreds of years. I don't know. Um, oh, Proxima as well. Sorry, I'm just looking at something. It's the, it's the, the Proxima situation or something like that, where they try and kill the emperor. <clears throat> some planet does, and they almost succeed. Uh, if it wasn't for the Empress Children. Yeah, quality. There's so much bits in this. It is fantastic and definitely worth reading. Um, there was another bit. You know the ideals of the Brotherhood were compatible with those you insist the Imperium of yours espouses? <laughs> oh. Okay, I'm not going to get too deep into that because that's too big a discussion. And I, yeah, I can't do it. 
<laughs> um, we get some amazing uh, combat, beautiful combat, big battle. Um, here we go. This is Pike to Fulgrim, and this is a message you should have taken in from what happens later. The search for perfection is a subtle drug, she read. It draws the mind along circuitous routes, deeper and deeper into itself, until nothing can be seen except the ideal. Desire blinds one to purpose, and thus renders true perfection impossible. Now that's some deep shit right there. That is some deep shit, and I'm sure I've read something similar somewhere, I can't remember where, but... I think that captures the sort of, um, I want to say dichotomy, but I'm not too sure that's the right word. <laughs> but the trap that the Emperor's children fall into, the trap that Fulgrim falls into, and the trap that many people do fall into, the, the pursuit of perfection, and it blinds them to the truth because they think they're on the right track. And, you know, I think that's, that's where I'm going to end this, because that's a fairly little deep, shitty thing to say. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this. I would, again, say... I'd say this is probably number one. Um, <laughs> number one at the minute for me is shared by this and the Perturabo novel. They are two of the best ones so far, out of the six. And uh, I cannot recommend this enough. It is quality. Um, and if you've enjoyed Josh Reynolds before, you'll love this. And if you've enjoyed the fabulous bile novels, you will love this. It's all it's like a companion piece. Um, yeah, fantastic read. Fantastic read. I'm just sorry it took so long. And uh, yeah, <laughs> fantastic. That's all I've got to say on the matter. All right, I'm going to go now. I will see you later. We'll be back again with another review soon. Um, a slightly shorter one. Because I've listened to a bunch of audiobooks recently. Uh, just to catch up on stuff that I'm never going to get around to reading if I don't. So, yeah, they've, they've been my uh, work travel stuff. And, yeah, let's be honest, while I'm sat at work, I've just been listening to this. So, yeah, <laughs> more stuff is coming soon. Um, I am currently reading, I don't know why I've picked up my car keys. I'm currently reading uh, Anarch, um, it's over there, uh, by the amazing Dan Abnett, which is the latest... And I think probably the last for a while Gorn's Ghost novel we're going to get. And uh, it's shaping up to be quite... I don't know. I was a bit bored at the start. But then stuff's ramped up. It's gone into high gear. And it's pretty good. There's lots of murdering. So, yeah. Get this. And enjoy it. It is... It's, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. And it's full of so much lore. And so much... Oh, it's brilliant. All right, I'm going to go. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you want to help me out, use the links below. Otherwise, please give this a like. And uh, remember to subscribe if you're not subscribed. All right, see you later. Cheers.